Hello, Rabbi Friedman. Uh, thank God it's Tuesday. Very, very happy to be um, again having this uh, magnificent time where we get the enormous amount of um, wisdom from you. And um, today the topic is going to be sort of a con continuation of what we have slightly touched upon uh, last week, uh, which is um, Torah's treatment of money and uh, the purpose of money and the moral aspect of money. That would be the topic of today's conversation. I think it's an important one, especially since um, the world has taken money to um, a really, really insane level where it became the whole purpose of life. And um, so today we would like to, I would really, really like to get deeper into what is the initial purpose of money in accordance to Torah? Well, if we go back far enough, all the way to creation, every animal finds its food, but human beings have to work for their food. And that's, you know, there was the result of eating from the tree of knowledge, where Odom was punished or cursed that by the sweat of his brow, he will make bread, which means you're going to have to work hard to make a living. Make a living means to have what to eat. That's how it all began. So in order to make a sandwich, you have to first plow the earth, or first get control of a little piece of earth that belongs to you, that is not contested by everybody else. <clears throat> and then you plow that little piece of uh, earth, and you plant the right seeds, and you wait for the season to do its thing, and then you harvest what you planted, and then you uh, put it through the grill, through the mill, and you grind it into flour. It just it takes about a year to make a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> That's called by the sweat of your brow. But the main thing is that you have to, often you have to buy the piece of land you have to buy the plow with which to plow, and you have to buy the seed that you're going to plant. Then you have to buy a mill with which to grind, and then you have to buy an oven in which to bake it all. So this is all part of the curse. Because in a, in a normal world, you should be able to find everything you need in nature should grow on trees, not money. Money doesn't grow on trees because you can't eat money. So instead of having money to buy the tree and what you need to eat should grow on the tree and it's right there, you can eat it. That would be a perfect world. We also know that when God curses, it's always a hidden blessing. What is the blessing in having to work for a living? Number of things. First of all, more than anything else, you come in contact with other people. If everyone could just go out and pick what they need off a tree, there would be no social life other than jealousy, competition. But when you have to earn a living, you have to work with others. They have something to sell, you need to buy, you get the product, they get the money. Win-win. It's a relationship, it's an interaction, it's a social contract. It's, it puts you in touch with people. And that is very valuable. 
So the blessing behind the need to make a living is that you come in contact with people you would otherwise never meet. The people you do meet is all by divine plan. Because somehow, somewhere, <clears throat> either you contribute to their life or they contribute to your life, but something good happens from the interaction. So that that's the first thing we have to bear in mind. Why am I leaving my house to be able to come back to feed my house? Because you got to come back with some achievement, with some goods. You met somebody, you helped somebody, you got help from somebody, you made friends with somebody. Something wonderful happened besides the money. So everybody, I think, can, can admit just the making of money doesn't feel justified. Why should that be necessary? I need what to eat and I have to go running around the world far away from home in order to be able to feed my family. It's crazy. So the justification is your, your purpose in life is not only for your family. It's a much broader uh, exposure to people, <clears throat> more contacts, more relationships, friendships, and so on. That's number one. Number two is charity. If everybody has their own tree and they can pick their food and eat, there'll be no opportunity for charity. But because everybody has to make a living and not everybody is equally talented, some people will need help in making a living They'll need a loan, they'll need some encouragement, they'll need partnership. Again, a great mitzvah that comes as a result of money, or the need for money. The beautiful thing is this, when you give a dollar to charity, or to a poor person, what went into that dollar? What did you invest in that dollar? Well, first of all, you got up early. If you didn't have to go to work, you wouldn't get up so early. So you gave up some sleep in order to make that dollar. Secondly, you traveled. You had to leave home. You had to drag yourself around town or even out of town in order to make this dollar. <clears throat> in order to make this dollar, you had to risk. You exposed yourself to all sorts of risks. In the olden days, on the roads, you would be robbed, mugged, whatever. Or you're exposed to other people with their germs, with their, with their flus. So anytime you leave home, you put yourself in some kind of a risk. So you invest your time, you give up your sleep, you put all your thinking, your, your, your brains, your ambitions, every part of you is invested in making a living that results in this dollar. When you give this dollar to charity, look at what you're giving. It's your life, it's your sleep, it's your thoughts, it's your ambition, it's everything. No dollar is without its history. How did it come to you? How did you get it? How did you make it? Most cases, it's a total commitment a total involvement in making this dollar, and you're willing to part with it, all of a sudden charity takes on a whole new meaning. So let's say everybody had a tree to pick their food from, but you happen to have a better tree. So you give some of your fruit to your neighbor. Very nice. Doesn't compare. You didn't invest in it, you didn't have to think about it, you didn't risk anything. So yeah, you would be generous, you'd share your fruit. But then it's only the fruit. Today, because you have to make a living, every dollar you share is a piece of your life. 
it's a, a chunk of you. So the mitzvah becomes incredibly uh, significant and, and powerful. So those are the two things, making contact with people and the ability to give charity. Then it's just nice to have money. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, Rabbi Friedman, there is seems to be a lot wrong with it these days, nevertheless. Um, for instance, um, the general attitude towards people with money is that they're not great human beings and there's a lack of trust for people who are really rich. Um, there's lack of trust of how people have acquired their wealth these days. It seems that it requires a lot of um, not say not not honest things, <laughs> not honest ways to make money. So it's so there's some sort of a distrust for rich people. Then there is some sort of a label that these are not the best people in the world. People with money. So. That kind of puts a negative connotation on that. Is there a way to, um, is there, is, how would you explain that basically? There, there is a moral um, challenge or a moral test, but it works both ways. Poverty can be very corrupting. It can make you miserable, antisocial, it can make you, uh, give you a criminal mind. Everything you see, your first thought is, can I steal it? Poverty is no picnic. And it doesn't necessarily make for moral people. The same is true with wealth. It can corrupt. It's a challenge. There's always a moral challenge in, in any circumstance, in any condition. Which is the better? What's the preferred challenge? Today, the preferred challenge is wealth. We should actually ask God, test us with wealth. Because with poverty, we have already done very well. <laughs> this is one of the special things about our hist history, our collective experience. We went through terrible poverty, and we handled it quite well. It didn't ruin us, it didn't destroy us, it didn't corrupt us, to a, to a great, impressive degree. Now we're ready to take the other challenge. Now let's see how well we can handle wealth. We're ready for the challenge. But it is, it is a challenge. Rabbi Friedman, when you say <clears throat> we, who do you mean by we? Because, me and you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm in. Because there, um, there is such a family as the Rothschilds, who I think have been there. Um, I believe they're the richest people on earth for the longest time, for centuries. Um, they're not, you know, as public as um, Elon Musk uh, and Bezos, but um, I believe they have way more money than them. They've been trillions for a while, uh, trillionaires for a while. So. And they're Jewish, so... And they've done well. They handle their wealth well. They're very charitable. They're humble. You know, as much as a billionaire can be humble. <clears throat> so they, they did well. It's a good example of handling wealth properly. They're, they're not using it to, to control others. They're not using it as a as a threat or as a, a whip. Um, as far I, as I know, no. I actually just saw a documentary about the Rothschilds, and I think they have the whole world by. <laughs> they, they're holding the whole world in their hands, pretty much. Yes, because. Um, um, they've lended money to everybody who is anybody throughout uh, centuries. 
So that's kind of controlling. Um, I mean, I guess it's an okay kind of control. Um, it's uh, oh, it's control in the financial world. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay. <clears throat> but they don't use it to start controlling people in, in their politics or in their religion. So they're 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 doing what they're good at. They're not they're not crossing any red lines. Um, identifying uh, failing the test of money, the t the test of wealth. How would you identify that? Um, on 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 different levels, not necessarily on a filthy rich level, on any level, because I think everybody has a little extra these days. So, um, and people might not be even realizing that they are failing the test of money. Um, first of all, at what point should people consider that they have money, um, and um, how how is this test measured uh, in our current situation? On an, to an, of an average person, of course. If you can afford to buy stocks, you're pretty rich. You have, uh, what is it called? Uh, disposable income? <laughs> That's pretty rich. In other words, you have more than you need. That is the feeling of wealth. I have more than I need. <clears throat> uh, of course, it depends on, on your appetite. How much do you think you need? So you can have people who have lots of money, but they feel like they need it all. None of it is, is disposable. But the feeling of wealth is the feeling that I have more than I need. And it doesn't matter what the dollar the dollar amount is. It's a very subjective experience. Now, the test is, a man is married. He has a house. He has children. He has a car. He has a community a congregation. He goes to a shul. That's his world, right? Now he gets rich. All of a sudden, his wife is not exactly what he what doesn't doesn't suit him. His children they're they're holding him back. They're 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 a liability. The house he's living in it doesn't it doesn't fit right. It, do, it doesn't look right. The car that he's driving an embarrassment. Even his community and his rabbi and his friends. They're all suddenly no good or not good enough. So he has to change his entire life to match his wealth. Now that's backwards. When you have wealth, you can really make the most of your life. If you have wealth, you can make your wife a queen. You can make your children comfortable. You can support your community. You can keep your house functioning. And you can drive your car just as well as any other car. So here's the point. Will your wealth enhance your life? Or will your life become... Uh, in, insufficient for you and you're going to have to replace it with a different life then the wealth is killing you so we need to really stop and think what, what is that what is that why is it that a rich man needs to drive a fancy car alright I can understand I mean if you can afford a better car well, who are you kidding you might as well Drive a nicer car. But what is it with your wife? She, she, she doesn't deserve to be rich with you? You have to replace her with a new model? And suddenly your children are not the most precious thing in your life? How did that happen? 
And now all of a sudden your rabbi doesn't know <laughs> doesn't know how to how to how to guide you or inspire you or what is that? Why is it that all of a sudden you're too good for everything in your life? That's poison. So the wealth has killed you. <clears throat> or is killing you. When a person knows how to handle wealth, when he gets wealthy, everyone around him benefits. Not pays the price. Uh, Rabbi Friedman, um, a lot of people became wealthy in the last, you know, 20 or so years. And the path was very different for a lot of people. And again, there is this distrust towards people who made it relatively quickly. Um, is there a way, um, how, sh maybe I'm asking right now about the outside world towards the people who have acquired wealth uh, recently. Is it jealousy, this distrust? Or is it factual? Or is it valid? Um, should people maybe change their attitude if they feel like whoever made a lot of money very quickly did it dishonestly, most likely? <laughs> there are people who are very disturbed, <clears throat> very uncomfortable with how come he has? What's about him? Who does he think he is? And then there are others who have the opposite feeling. Why don't I have? What's wrong with me? Either way, it's an uncomfortable feeling. Um, I don't know if you use the same word for both, but they're both forms of jealousy. I can feel jealous because I don't think you deserve. Who are you? Where do you come off being rich? The other is, are you telling me something's wrong with me? I'm a failure? I'm a loser? You're telling me that I'm no good? So who's more dangerous? If you feel hurt, like you're the loser, that's much more dangerous. That's, that's like Germany in the 30s. What? We're the losers? Oh, no. Uh, also, there, these are the two forms of anti-Semitism. One is, how come the Jews are chosen? What's, what, what's with them? What's so special about them? Why them? Okay, but then there are those who say, and I'm not, I'm not as important, I'm not as good, I'm not chosen. Oh, those are dangerous. So psychologically, there's a jealousy of anyone who is better than me. But then there's also the, the hurt of being put down or denied. So when your ego can't stand being number two, that's dangerous. Whether it's anti-Semitism or jealousy of the wealthy. And then you start thinking, you know, uh, he's not really better than me. I mean, he's a liar, he's corrupt. He got the money through uh, dishonest means. Yeah, I want to tear him down because I don't, I don't like his being superior to me. But that comes second. The first thing is we hate being made to look less. So the rich... And there's truth to it also. It's not just imaginary. The rich are advantaged. Yeah, it's an advantage to be rich. There's no question. But like we spoke last week, that is not a threat to those who are not rich. Become rich? Who's stopping you? 
it's not like there are only ten dollars in the cat in the register, and you have to decide who is going to get the ten dollars. There's plenty of ten dollar bills for everybody. He got his. You go get yours. You don't have to take his. There is no shortage. Again, that that is that is the the basis, the false assumption and belief that all socialism is based on. We're all fighting over the same dollar. We need a system by which the dollar can be shared equitably because there's only one dollar for all of us. And that's a crazy notion. There is a dollar for everybody. Stop fighting over it. Just go get yours. Rabbi Friedman, um, money is a test. Everybody knows that. But um, what kind of a test is it? I mean, there are so many smart people out there and kind and good people that never even get the test. They just simply don't get the test. Uh, then there are some people who, uh, without trying, have have it all then there are some people who are just wonderful at stealing and they get it that way and uh, god lets them have it this way so where is this test where where is it hidden or where is it obvious so you're, you're asking why do different people have different tests what makes this one have the test of wealth and this one of of poverty, this one of strength, and this one of weakness, this one of knowledge, and this one of ignorance. Either way, you're being tested. But why the difference in the tests? So it could have something to do with a past life. <clears throat> Whatever you failed at in your past life, you're now going to be tested in this life, because you're getting a second chance. So, um, collectively, if everyone succeeds and passes their own test, then collectively we've made the world perfect. Poverty can be a source of goodness. Wealth can be a source of goodness. Strength can be a source of goodness. Weakness can be a source of goodness. From every situation, if we can extract the goodness, we have repaired every part of the world. So somebody has to be tested with wealth and somebody has to be tested with poverty. The poor man has a very legitimate complaint to God. <laughs> I don't mind being tested, but why can't I have the test of wealth? It's a good it's a good argument. God has to justify it. Or God is more indebted to the person who passes the test of poverty than to the person who passes the test of wealth. Because he, he did pass the test, but he was having a very good time. <laughs> Whereas the poor guy who passed the test and he wasn't having a good time. So God owes him more to make up for it. But here's the problem. We get more focused on what the test is than, than the need to pass the test. So if I don't like the test I'm given, I don't want I don't want to succeed. I don't want to be good at what I have. I want to have something else and be good at that. Well then I've messed up the whole thing. And I've really lost the, the game. We got to appreciate and enjoy the tests we're given. Because there is a reason. Whatever it is. Like a soldier doesn't ask, why was I given this job? Why do I have to be in this battlefront? Why do I have to... Well, it's a good question, but as long as you're there, do what you have to do and come back alive. You know? 
Um, Rabbi Friedman, we were also speaking a couple of weeks ago about innocence in relationships, that once manipulation comes into play, the innocence is lost. It seems that making money involves manipulation rather than just good, honest approach to making money. Um, does that mean that there is no innocence in our day and time? In because, uh, or does it mean that we can be lose our innocence only in one area of our lives? And uh, honestly, I'm speaking about everybody. I, I'm, I'm serious. Somewhere, somehow, everybody needs to manipulate just a little bit to make money. I'm not saying they have to be crooks, but somewhere, somehow, people are scheming or, you know, like a little bit. Everybody is doing it. So does that mean that we don't live in the age of innocence at all? Or can we separate this aspect of our life from the rest of the aspects of our life and still be innocent as a, as a generation? The, the definition of any test is a loss of innocence. That's the danger. <clears throat> whether it's financial innocence, uh, intimate innocence, whatever it is. A person who can say, in all, in all my life, I have never, uh, I have never used or accepted a single dollar that wasn't completely honestly earned. That would be an amazing human being. And there are such people. They are so careful. They'd rather give away thousands and thousands to make sure that it's all legitimate than to have on their conscience a single dollar that they didn't earn honestly. Those are very special people. Doesn't Torah demand that kind of approach to money? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And most people think they're doing it. Most people will tell you, oh, I never stole anything. Uh, <laughs> depends on how you define stealing, right? It's like, but those people who are really, really on top of it, it's a priority to them. The main thing is not a single dishonest dollar. It's even more important than, than the honest dollar. Those are, those are highly moral people. And who oh, if somebody said, if you're rich, you can eat well. If you're innocent, you can sleep well. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Rabbi Friedman, how come people are so um, jealous when it comes to finances and not so much when it comes to intellect? I mean, isn't it great to be smart and intellectual and... Um, but it doesn't seem like this is as much of a drive as becoming rich, wealthy, having money, being able to buy things. <laughs> How many people are jealous of wisdom? Not too many, because very few people will admit that they're lacking wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, what's his name is very smart, but I'm pretty smart too. What do you think I am, a dummy? But when your bank account is zero, <laughs> you will admit, <clears throat> at least to yourself, that you're poor. And so you're jealous of the rich. Also, why are people not jealous of a really good marriage, a happy marriage, a happy home? Happy children. Well, some people are. But again, the same thing. What am I going to admit that I'm a bad husband? 
So we don't want to admit that there is something to be jealous of, except when it comes to money, because that you can't, you know, you can't, you can't lie about it. You can't deceive yourself. There's no money in the bank. <laughs> okay, so now I'm jealous. Rabbi Friedman, about money and the way money has evolved. I mean, originally it started, the, val the most valuable things were precious metals such as gold and silver. Then it became, later on, paper money that was... Um, um, that was supported by gold and silver. Now we have paper money, which is not supported by anything, and we're uh, cryptocurrency is the new thing. So, um, does that at all matter? Um, is just so people maybe? I mean, we do live by the Torah. So right now, where would we feel the best? Investment could be. Is it something that was true through the ages, such as gold and silver? Uh, is that something that will always be a constant, or should we be evolving and accepting um, to the new currencies that are coming up, even though we don't really know who is behind them? <laughs> so it's kind of a little bit scary right there. Yeah. Well, there's one other form of, of wealth, and that is real estate. That's probably the best, the preferred, to have real estate. That's stable, it's predictable, it's, uh, it's real. Paper money, that's flimsy. And it leaves you a lot of anxiety. Real estate gives you security, paper money gives you anxiety. What about precious metals like gold and silver? They're a little more stable, it's not paper money. But even that comes and goes. It rises, it falls, it gets stolen. So real estate is always the best. So that's why when the Jews came into, into, into Israel, they were promised a piece of real estate. Every tribe got its, uh, its location, its cities, its... And then go ahead, plant your plant your vineyards and plant your uh, your olive trees and enjoy life. And that's why every fifty years, the jubilee year, all real estate goes back to its owner. So you can sell, you can lease real estate to others, but not forever. Fifty years, I think, is the maximum that you can play with money. After that, you're so tangled up, you gotta go back to, okay, let's start, let's, let's go back to real estate. And let's start all over again, and it's a good system. And I think if you look at the uh, economy in the United States, every 50 years, there's a crisis. Because it's paper money, how long can it, you know, how long can it hold up? What about cryptocurrency? Can we trust something that we can't really understand fully? Well, it, it's, it's, it's a make-believe value. Right? It's just an, an agreed value. Let's call this money and let's pay a lot for it. Uh, Rabbi Friedman, what about this concept that everybody has accepted nowadays that uh, financial freedom? So you have money, you're a free person. Um, is that a correct, true statement, or is it sort of, sort of a flimsy statement as well? Yeah, there, you know, there's some truth to it. You're freer when you can afford to buy whatever it is you need or want. On the other hand, you become enslaved in some other fashion. It's a more comfortable enslavement a preferred enslavement. And um, one more, not very comfortable to um, 
speak about it, but it's a must because it's the reality of our life. Usually when we say money, there's two more words that follow power and sex and not necessarily in that order. How come all of this is so lumped in together and is identified by money? No, it's all ego. Back in the olden days, it would be goats. More goats. <laughs> <clears throat> so it depends on what 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 strokes the ego. In today's world, for whatever reason, the things that stroke the ego is fame, money, and sex. Somehow those things indicate that you're a winner. But none of it is true. Fame doesn't prove anything. The worst people can become famous. The most worthless people can become famous. Fame doesn't mean anything. Money, same thing. Being rich is not an indication of superior human being or superior qualities. And sex, I mean, what, what, what in the world does that prove? So it's all, it's all hype. Ego hype. So what can a person be proud of? I mean, we've got to have some ego, no? <clears throat> what can a person be proud of? Ultimate. The ultimate. Proud of your children. That is such a legitimate pride. And it doesn't mean you're proud of their greatness. You know, some people are proud of their children, and their children are nothing special. But if your children make you proud, it is the biggest blessing in the world. And it does show something about you. Everybody will admit that. You have good children, you did something right. The next best thing is proud of your ancestors. Proud of where you come from. The worst is proud of what you accomplished. There is a lot to think about, Rabbi Friedman. <laughs> Well, the biggest blessing is to have nachas from your children. Yeah. And there's a joke about, you know, the, the, the Jewish hang up with my son, the doctor. So there's this woman who became president of the United States, and her mother was invited to the inauguration. And all the pomp and ceremony, and they bring other you know, music plays on it. The army band and the president of the United States comes to the microphone. And this woman leans over to the woman next to her and says, you know who that is? You know who that woman is? Her brother is a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we can call it the simple life, right? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. So, uh, Rabbi Friedman, thank you so much. Unfortunately, now we are kind of running out of time, which is always a very sad moment for me. But um, this was amazing. A lot of fantastic insights and hopefully something that will help a lot of people know how to understand life a little better, have their priorities and morals um, in according to the, the, the in the right way. In, in the right order, <laughs> let's put it that way. And we should all be tested with wealth and put it all to good use and prove to the world that wealth can also be moral. Thank you so much, Robert Friedman.